Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Bible Baptist Church. So thankful you're here. And uh, we are grateful to be with you this morning uh, in your home, most likely, uh, coming to you by way of live stream. I want to thank Pastor John and Tyler Smith for doing so much work the last few days to set up all of the technology and software and equipment necessary to connect with you with a better connection and with a higher quality experience. And I pray that God will use our time together. Uh, I've been so impressed by the uh, connectivity that our church has demonstrated during these unusual times, reaching out to one another on the phone and through Facebook and Zoom calls and other means, and I want to commend you for that and ask you to keep up the good work. I think our, between our deacons and Pastor John and myself and Jessica Paisley, we've talked to just about every person in our church family over the past week and tried to check on everyone, and I can say that the Lord has been good to our church family. We have a number of people with prayer requests and needs and uh, several layoffs, but God's been faithful and good, and I want to encourage you to remain connected over the coming weeks as we struggle through this season together. We're in this together. We'll get through it together. God's going to see us through it, and uh, I want to thank you uh, and tell you how grateful I am that you're a part of the Bible Baptist Church family and or that you're gathering with us this morning on live uh, stream to uh, learn the Word of God and to draw closer to our Lord. We were praying just a minute ago as a group before we started and at first, I thought Pastor John's hands were lifted in praise, but then I realized he was just trying to make sure I was six feet away. And uh, so, but we're getting through it, and I know you are too. Uh, after our service today, when this portion ends with the worship and the preaching of the word, I want to remind you if you have children uh, nearby or if you're a kid at heart, to uh, find us on Facebook Live and uh, tune in as, pa as uh, Mr. Jeff, one of our Sunday school teachers, uh, shares a creative and fun Bible story for the kids, something that I know they'll enjoy since they can't be in Sunday school today. I was encouraged this week when I came across uh, 2 Timothy 2.9 when Paul said that the Word of God can't be bound. And if circumstances try to tie down the Word of God, it's going to not happen. It's going to go forth, and I trust that it's going forth in your life and the lives of others, not only from our church and through this internet connection, but uh, thousands and thousands like it all over the world. Uh, I refuse to get discouraged by the circumstances in which we're in and by the separation that we're now experiencing, but while I refuse to become discouraged by it, I also refuse to grow accustomed to it. I feel like the Apostle Paul, when he wrote the Thessalonian believers, when he said, brethren, we've been taken away from you for a short time in presence, but not in heart. And we are endeavoring more eagerly to see your face with great desire. I want you to know, Bible Baptist family, that's exactly how I feel about you. We're separated from each other in presence. I don't like it, but we're not separated in heart. And I want us to lean into this together, and I pray that uh, you're closer to the Lord on the other side of this season uh, because of your own personal walk. I pray that you are able to get the gospel to some people online who otherwise maybe wouldn't have shared this time in the Word together with us. And I pray that our anticipation and appreciation grows for the gathered assembly of believers in person, uh, real live together. I want to have a word of prayer with you, and I want to ask you to join me in prayer right now. After we pray together, uh, Pastor John and Nicole will lead us in some worship this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and kindness to us. We thank you for your patience, your faithfulness, your love, and your tender care. I thank you that you're with us even now. Though we'd like to be in this auditorium with hundreds of brothers and sisters, we take comfort in knowing that you're here with us. And with the people on the other side of these screens, you're with them as well. Thank you for that. Now I pray that we'd sense that. And I pray that as we sing your praises and open your word and seek you in prayer, that your presence would be known and experienced by all those who know you. And I pray that everybody would take a step closer to you as a result of this time gathering virtually today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. So glad that you've tuned in. And uh, wherever you're watching this, we're going to come together in the spirit of worship now, sing a couple songs, whether from your living room, your vehicle, your office, wherever it may be. We want to make his praise glorious this morning. And uh, though these times are difficult, we don't understand them, uh, we sure wish we could change them. Our sovereign God is in control. And uh, there's nothing... Uh, 
greater than we could do today than just return to that place in our hearts where we remember that Christ is our firm foundation. He is what we build our life upon. And that's why we're going to sing this song. So from your living room or wherever you are, sing with us this morning. Build my life. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Yes, we do. Sing it with us now, everybody. Jesus, the name above every other name. And Jesus, the only one who could ever save. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Lift your heart now. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me oh, that's your prayer Jesus the name above every other name sing it now Jesus the only one who could ever say you're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Oh, we live for you. He's holy. Holy, there is no one like you, and there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and i will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and i will put my trust in you alone and i And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken and holy. There there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those Boy, I hope that's your prayer in this time. So much fear, so much confusion. May we be showing his love to those around us. Let's be reminded with this one more song today that every need we have we can find in Christ Jesus. You are my strength when I'm weak, Lord. You are my all in all. Let's sing it together. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Sing it, church. Jesus. Lamb of 
of God, worthy is your name, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name, taking my sin, my cross, my shame, Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. And when I fall down, you pick me up. And when I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Sing it with us. Jesus, Lamb of God. Lamb of God, worthy is your name, Jesus, Lamb of God. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Now let's get ready, open our hearts to hear from God's Word. I pray that you're encouraged today as we open the Word of God and as we look into it together, just like we always would. And I want to make a couple of quick announcements and reminders during this unusual time. First of all, I want you to know that uh, for the first time, we're able to have this streaming capability at howellchurch.org. So from this point forward on Sunday mornings at 1030, on Tuesdays at 7, and on Thursdays at 7, until we're able to resume gathering live and in person, I want to encourage you to go to howellchurch.org slash live stream. And when you visit that web address, uh, that'll contain the uh, content that's being streamed. And uh, over the next week or two, we'll continue to, to develop some additional features. We'll probably be on YouTube by this time next week. And uh, we'll notify you. Uh, we'll probably uh, establish a channel so that these things can be shared uh, by you and, and uh, so that we can continue to try to get the gospel to as many people as we possibly can. But we'll email you about that and put notes here on our church Facebook page and on the church website as well over that time. I want to encourage you when today's uh, time of worship finishes to share this video. Uh, with your Facebook friends. I want to encourage you to uh, invite others to watch with us on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Sundays. And I want to let you know that if you have a prayer request, you can either share it in the comments today or uh, you can message me at my Facebook uh, contact or Nicole, or Pastor John. You can message the church uh, through the Facebook app or you can just send us an email. My email is pastor at howellchurch.org. If there's a financial need or a need for groceries or something from the pharmacy, we just want to be the church right now and meet each other's needs and stay connected with each other and support one another. So if there's something that's needed in your life uh, or if there's a prayer request, either related to this or totally unrelated, you let us know. I know uh, many folks are applying for unemployment and making arrangements and things of this nature. And if there's lost wages or a financial issue with mortgage, rent, utilities, et cetera, you just let us know. We want to definitely do all we can to support each other in prayer and then maybe even in some cases support each other from a financial perspective. Uh, I want to also mention that uh, you should stay connected to the church Facebook page because not only will our live broadcasts be there, but also every day by noon, I'm going to try to make sure I've shared something new at facebook.com slash BBC Howell. So if you haven't liked and followed our church Facebook page, all you need to do is type into your browser, uh, facebook.com forward slash BBC Howell, and that'll bring you right to the church Facebook page, uh, which is where about half of you probably are watching this stream right now. 
And uh, like that and follow it. And check back each day, middle of the day, and we'll make sure there's either some printed material or some video content from us or from others. I've been really encouraged by some things that others have shared online over the past couple of weeks. And uh, we're going to try to be sharing things there with you over the next couple of weeks. Nicole will probably even meet some of you ladies online there as well, and uh, we'll try to stay connected as best we can. I know many folks have been diligent, and this has meant so much to me, about making sure that their giving to the Lord through the church has not been interrupted. And I've had many people message me or call me or text me to make sure that they're honoring the Lord. And I know that you do this not just to meet the needs of Bible Baptist Church, but you do it as an act of worship unto the Lord, which is exactly why and how I do it as well. And I appreciate you and commend you for being faithful in your giving. There are three or four different ways to give. We installed a new uh, highly user-friendly and highly secure app on our church uh, website uh, called Planning Center or Church Center, it's also known as. And thousands and thousands of church use, churches use this software for their online giving. It's replaced our previous method, and I want to encourage you to use uh, that app. You can find it at howellchurch.org slash give. And when you go to that page, there's a little uh, icon that you click that says give, and that'll connect you to this secure uh, third-party hosted online giving portal. Uh, there's a couple ways you can do that there. You can do that with a credit card or a debit card, or you can do it with a checking account. And I just want you to know that if you do it with a checking account, you save the two and a quarter percent processing fee. So that's a little way to make sure that our dollars are not lost on administrative or internet processing fees. Uh, so when I set that up for my own giving this past week, I went ahead and put my banking checking number and routing number and set that up so that each week it's an ACH transaction, and I, I know you might do that as well. If you don't give that way, you definitely can still mail your giving in. Uh, we are checking the church mail a few times a week, and uh, you can mail it, of course. The church address is here on the Facebook page. And then you can also go to your bill pay feature on your online banking at your local bank. If you have a bank that you use that you have online connection to with a bill pay portal, you can actually just enter the church there and uh, your bank at no charge will either send a check or electronic funds to the church in that way. So those are ways that we can be faithful in giving over the coming weeks. And I know many of you care about that. I want to remind you that we have established a fourth category for giving. Uh, Nicole and I, for 20-some years, have been in the habit of giving to the general fund, and that's where we give a tenth of uh, our income. And then secondly, we've, we've had the practice since we were in college of giving to missions over and above our regular giving. And then most years in our lives, we've been in the habit of giving to building programs. And then now there's a fourth category, if the Lord leads you. And this is, of course, just uh, as the Lord leads to do something special. We've created a benevolence fund just for the coronavirus period for those who have financial needs uh, during this season. So I encourage you to use that. Well, I'm looking forward to jumping into Psalm 145. I want to encourage you to use a device or find your own physical copy of the Bible. That's the best way. And open to Psalm 145, and let's join together there. Uh, this is a special one Sunday message to deal with who the Lord is during this unprecedented, unusual season in which we're now living. And then next Sunday, I'm very, very much looking forward to joining you here online for Palm Sunday. We'll preach a special message on the theme of Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem uh, one week before his uh, crucifixion. And then the following Sunday, of course, is Easter Sunday, uh, one of my very favorite days of the calendar year. And I'm looking forward to preaching on the resurrection of our glorious and risen Lord on Easter Sunday morning. But today, Psalm 145. I want to say that each week, as we have the teaching and preaching of the Word, my expectation is that God is speaking to people's hearts. And that while the Word of God is being read and taught, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you directly. And I just want to say, let Him do that. And when we pray in a moment, ask Him to do that. And then I want to ask you to do one more thing. If you're watching today, whether you're a part of our church family or brand new to us, if you have a question about your relationship with the Lord, or if you feel like there's a step you need to take or a response that you need to give when it comes to your relationship with the Lord or your walk spiritually, I want you to email me or message us at the church Facebook page. 
you can email me at pastor at howellchurch.org. If you have a question or a spiritual need or, of course, a prayer request, that's a way we can follow up on this time together. As we come to the Bible, I believe it's important that we use this time to feed our faith. I guarantee you social media and the cable news media will fuel your fear. And this is important to balance out that fueling of the fear with the feeding of our faith. Let's pray together. Father, speak to our hearts as we open your word. Thank you for the kinship that we have because of the Holy Spirit. And thank you that our physical limitations do not limit our spiritual connection with you and our kindred heart for one another. Please bless our time together in your word. And I pray that you would encourage those who know you, your sons and daughters. And I pray for those who maybe need to begin a relationship with you, that this would be the day when they take a giant step forward toward you as you have taken so many steps for so long toward them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the past 17 days, an unexpected global threat has upended our lives. I remember a couple of weeks ago thinking that this is just one of those viruses that comes and goes every couple of years, usually in places far away from Howell, Michigan. And if it ever even does get to the United States, it'll probably just be in some uh, international port or some place where international travelers uh, are uh, convening or converging. But little did I know that just a number of days later, all of our lives would be upended and affected by this coronavirus disease. I think it became real to me on Wednesday, March 11th, when I saw the announcement late that night between the time we had gathered for the last time in our growth groups and our children had Awana, between the time we had met that night between 7 and 8, and then uh, it was just about time to go to bed, and I saw the announcement that I would have never predicted, and that is that the NBA season was canceled. I think it was just a few minutes after that that I saw that Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson had contracted the coronavirus. And then immediately I thought to myself, it's getting real. Little did I know that two days later, our schools here in Michigan would close their doors, and that restaurants would close their dining rooms a few days after that. That people in our church who work for the auto manufacturers or suppliers would be told to stay home and they'd be laid off. Little did I know that a week or so after that, the governor would mandate that we shelter in place at home, that the manufacturing industry would come to a screeching halt, that we'd put the news on and find these counts increasing by the hour of people who had been infected around the world and close to home in our own state and now, of course, in our own community. And even worse, people who had lost their lives. For me, the last couple of weeks, frankly, have been disorienting. The changed schedule, the restrictions thrust upon me, the financial uncertainties, the canceled plans, the -the around-the-clock news cycle, it's all sort of formed a thick fog for me, and I think for many of you it has as well mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. There are moments in our lives when we can see God clearly, usually as, an, as a result of an encounter with his word. But there are other times in our lives when the fog seems to roll in, as it has these last days. When the fog rolls in, we have to fight through the fog, and we have to find the Lord in his word. We have to see what he says about himself. We have to pull the scriptures close to us and find out about how his greatness can be experienced in our lives in the midst of uncertainty. David, who wrote Psalm 145, who wrote more psalms than any other writer, is one of those Bible characters that we can so often identify with because he experienced all of the range of emotions and ups and downs personally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, and relationally that we all experience over the course of our lives. And I'm so thankful that we have recorded for us in the Scriptures so much of the reality 
of what his relationship with the Lord and others like him looked like. And that's the case with Psalm 145. The truths we see in Psalm 145 are not truths only for the coronavirus pandemic season, but for any season of our lives. When we find ourselves facing uncertainty, pain, difficulty, or loss. And I know that some of you were in a season like that even just a few weeks ago before this pandemic. And some of us, after this pandemic is over, will move into a similar season of uncertainty. And we need Psalm 145. I think we have the Bible in part because God wants us to know him. And within the Bible, we have the book of Psalms that is so unique. The longest book of the Bible, 150 Psalms. These are songs or poems that were intended by the Jewish worshipers to be sung. When words are set to music, they're more easily remembered. You know that. So we put things to tunes to help us remember them. God knows that's how it works. He probably invented that. And so the Psalms are God's songbook provided for us so that we would remember some vital things, especially things about him. So as we look into Psalm 145, I want you to look for a special phraseology that's here. It's a three-word phrase. The Lord is. That little expression, the Lord is, appears four times in this psalm, and it teaches us some very important certainties about our God. Psalm 145, I'll begin reading in verse number one. Follow along. We're not going to read the entire psalm, but we'll begin with the first three verses. I will extol thee, my God, O King. I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. Skip down to verse number eight. The Lord is, there's that expression. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Skip down to verse 17. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. The Lord is. These realities in which we are now living highlight how constantly and utterly dependent we always are on the Lord for every little thing in life, things that a few weeks ago we took for granted. But today we realize we need the Lord more than ever before. If your peace or your sense of security or your courage and faith and confidence are going to remain intact, in the middle of uncertain circumstances, it's going to be because you found those things in the person and character of God. In the middle of uncertain times, the only way to have confidence and poise and strength and faith and peace is when we stop looking at ourselves for those things or other people for those things or our employer, or our circumstances, or our national economy for those things, and when we look directly to the Lord. Because the circumstances in which we're living, whenever we face difficult circumstances, do not change the character of our God, and they do not alter the promises of his word. So during times of uncertainty, I find five essential truths about our God that are real, whether we understand them fully or not, whether we meditate on them, they're true. But during moments like this, we need to lean into these truths, rediscover them, and then I pray that each of us experience them. The first truth about our God that I find in Psalm 145 is that God is present. God is present. Verse 18, the Lord is nigh or near unto all those who call upon him. Verse 19, he will hear their cry and he will save them. 
The Lord is present in your life. He's not distant. I know sometimes our circumstances can fool us. And when the fog rolls in and the circumstances begin to shift, we can think God is distant, but he's not. He's close. He's not only present because he is omnipresent, he's everywhere at once, but he's also present because of the ministry of his Holy Spirit. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've established a relationship with God through his Son, Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He's with you in an extraordinary way. The Lord is near unto all those who have a broken heart, Psalm 34, 18. As the mountains are around Jerusalem, so the Lord is around his people from henceforth and forever. Psalm 139 says, Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou surround or compass my path. You are acquainted with all my ways. There is not a word in my tongue, but, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me or surrounded me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Whither shall I go from thy spirit and where should I flee from thy presence? You can't outrun God's presence. And that's a good thing for believers to know that he is with us. God is present. I love the way Psalm 118 verse 6 says it. It says, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. Because the Lord is on your side, because God is present, you don't have to fear. He says in Psalm 73, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. I will instruct you, Psalm 32, 8, and I'll teach you in the way you should go. That's what God promises to you. God is present. On the night before Jesus went to the cross of Calvary, he gathered with one final meal with his disciples. They were filled with fear as he talked about his coming departure. They were confused. He began to explain to them that their heart should not be troubled, John 14, 1, that he would go away. But he began to explain in John 14, 15, and 16 that he would send his presence, though it would be spirit presence, it would nonetheless be real in their lives. He said, the spirit will dwell with you, Psalm fourteen seventeen. excuse me, John fourteen seventeen, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. At that day you shall know. I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. That's Jesus Christ's words, not just for the disciples, but for every believer in Christ. Because of the Holy Spirit, we can experience Jesus' peace. That's what he says later in chapter 14. He says, my peace I give to you because I and my spirit will make our abode. We will set up our home, verses 20 through 23, within you. When I find my sense of security in the healthcare system or in my own physical strength, that security can easily be lost. If I, my, if I find my sense of stability in the national economy or in the stability of my employer or in geopolitical stability or from the cable news telling me that everything's okay, which I don't think they've ever said, I'm going to not have a great sense of strength or stability. But if I find my sense of peace and strength in the presence of Jesus Christ, it can never be taken away because the Holy Spirit can never be taken away. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. God is present. The second truth about God I see here, the Lord is, is that not only is God present, but God is good. Our present God is a good God. Verse 9 in Psalm 145, The Lord is good to all. His tender mercies are over all his works. Verse 17 says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways, holy in all his works. Hey, don't ever doubt that God 
is good. If you look at your circumstances to try to interpret whether God is good, you'll sometimes doubt. But if you look at the Word of God, then you can look at your circumstances in light of what you know about God, and you can determine that God is good. The devil's strategy has always been to get God's children to question his goodness. That's exactly what he did with Eve in the garden. He tried to get her to question whether God was really good in what he had said to her and to her husband. But God is good. Sometimes we are like our little children are when they don't get exactly what they want when they want it. We begin to question whether God really is truly good or whether he loves us. But that's why we need the Bible. That's why we've been given the Bible, so that in the midst of difficulty and confusion, we can come to the Word and we can find in black and white pages of Scripture that he is good. Psalm 73, 1, truly, the Lord is good. Psalm 135, 3, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Abraham said in Genesis eighteen twenty five, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? God only ever always does right. Psalm 119, you are good and you do good. God doesn't make mistakes and he always acts in your best interest. Our circumstances are not always what we would have asked for. Often they're not. But he is always present and he is always good. That doesn't mean people are always good or that circumstances are good. We live among sinners. We are sinners. We live on a planet that is suffering from the curse of sin as a human race. And that includes pain and suffering and, yes, disease and even death. Life on earth isn't always good, but God is always good. In the midst of it and above it, God is always good. And if you're patient, you'll come to see God's goodness. There will be little moments along the way when you're able to look over your shoulder and say, God was good. Or at the end of your race, and certainly upon our arrival in heaven, we'll testify together and rejoice for eternity that God is not only present, but God is good. The Lord is good, Lamentations 3.25 to those who wait for him. Oftentimes, our ability to understand God's goodness requires that we're patient during the time of questioning and uncertainty or difficulty. Psalm 145 tells us five things about God. The Lord is. God is present. God is good. God is sovereign. Verse 3, his greatness is unsearchable. God is in control, and he rules over all things in and around your life with absolute authority. Psalm 47, God is the king of all the earth. God reigns over the heathen. He sits on the throne of his holiness. Psalm 147, great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. Psalm 103, 19, the Lord has prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. I love what Paul said in Colossians about the Lord Jesus Christ. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and by him all things consist. Our triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit are sovereign. The realities that we've been thrust into the last three weeks have demonstrated how not sovereign we are, how powerless we are to control our own destinies or to plan our own days. A little, tiny, invisible, microscopic germ has brought the entire world to a screeching halt and taken thousands of lives. If we ever needed a reminder that we're small, weak, fragile, and powerless. This is our opportunity to look at ourselves and see our own lack of power and then look up to God and see his great power. Nebuchadnezzar is an example of a Bible character, a king over a great empire who thought a little too highly of himself and was a little too impressed with his own authority 
his own power. You see, he thought he was sovereign. He thought he was in control. And what happened was God humbled him. You can read about his story in the book of Daniel chapter 4, where Nebuchadnezzar, after having been warned by Daniel to humble himself, refused to humble himself and actually lost his mind. As an act of prophetic fulfillment that Daniel had warned him of, Nebuchadnezzar, the most revered royalty on the planet at the time, went insane. He lost his mind, and for seven years, he lived among the beasts in the wilderness, literally eating grass out of his mind, not on his throne. At the end of this seven years, Nebuchadnezzar came back. He was awakened. He came back to his senses. He put clothes back on, cleaned himself up, was restored as the king of Babylon. And here's what he said. He said, I blessed the Most High, and I praise and honor him that lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can stay or stop his hand or say to him, What doest thou? Nebuchadnezzar learned that no one says to God, That's enough, or Why would you do that? No one questions him, no one rivals him, no one overrules him. Why? Because even the king of Babylon needed to learn God is sovereign. God's sovereignty is a great encouragement to believers because we can know that when we can't control things, we have a good and present Father who does. Ephesians 1 tells us that he works all things after the counsel of his own will. If you're like me, and I know you are in this sense, we share a human nature that likes to be in control it's sort of an internal risk management mechanism where we like to be in control over things in our lives. <clears throat> when we begin to lose control, <clears throat> whether it's a parent losing control over their child, <clears throat> whether it's an individual losing control over their uh, assets, or whether it's a person losing control over their reputation or their employment, we begin to work ourselves into a panic because we can't get the people around us to cooperate with our good plan. We certainly can't get the world economies and our own health and even oftentimes our own immediate family during our stay-at-home quarantine to cooperate with us. We like to be in control. It drives us crazy. It drives the people around us crazy. It's really a recipe for anxiety and stress, this, this insistence that we have to be in control. But when we remind ourselves that though we aren't in control, God is, we can rest. We can relax and we can rejoice because we know that a present God holds the kingdoms of the world and our home and our lives in the palm of his good hands. He's present He's good. He's sovereign. There's a fourth thing about God, an essential truth in this psalm. God is faithful. God is faithful. The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy, verse 8 says. If you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have become the adopted son or daughter of God Almighty. And he deals with you as a faithful father. The Lord is faithful, 2 Thessalonians 3.3. 3. He will establish you, and we have confidence in the Lord. Our confidence comes not from our own faithfulness or the faithfulness of others, or the dependability of our circumstances. Our confidence comes from the faithfulness of God. Twice in 1 Corinthians, Paul simply said, God is faithful. Hebrews 13, 5. 
I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. I know that you have been through seasons in your life, and maybe this is a season when you have felt that maybe God forgot you, abandoned you, gave up on you, or even in some cases, cursed you. If you're a child of God, you never have to worry about that. And if you haven't established a relationship with the Lord, he invites you to come into a faithful relationship with him even today. Our circumstances will cause us to question the faithfulness of God. And that's why in those moments when these feelings come our way of having been abandoned, we need to run to the word of God and let it remind us that we have a loving and faithful father. And it will remind us that he is faithful. We can find places of scripture like where Jeremiah wrote in the book of Lamentations. During a national season of devastation and destruction, he wrote in Lamentations 3.22, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. God is present God is good, God is sovereign, and God is faithful. These are things that we read about in the Bible, and we accept as true because they're in the Bible. But what will happen over the course of your life is that you will come to not only read these things in the Bible, but experience them. And I think that's where our faith goes from an academic faith to a personal dynamic faith. When over the course of your life, through the ups and downs of your life, you, God proves or demonstrates to you that he is faithful. And you know, without the seasons of difficulty or uncertainty, we wouldn't lean into or cast ourselves upon God's faithfulness, nor see his faithfulness. Because we could give credit to the world for being faithful to us, or people, or circumstances being faithful to us. But when the circumstances and the world and the people fall apart and are not faithful, we can look at God who stands alone as the faithful one. We could praise his name. Though the mountains were cast into the sea, he stands faithful. Paul said in his last letter that at first, no man would stand with him and all men forsook him. 2 Timothy 4, 16. Nevertheless, he said in verse 17, the Lord stood with me and he strengthened me. When circumstances betray you, when people betray you, the Lord will be faithful. There was a song years ago that said, if we never had a problem, we wouldn't know that he's the answer. God is present. God is good. God is sovereign God is faithful. The final truth that I think is so important to take away from this psalm is that God is working. He's always working. He's not sitting on his hands. He hasn't fallen asleep at the wheel of your life or the universe. God is working. Verse 19, he will fulfill the desire of them to fear him. He will hear their cry. He will save them. While you're waiting... God's working. We can't always see it, but we must accept it by faith because the word tells us while you're waiting, God's working. Psalm 121, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He that keeps Israel shall not slumber, nor shall he sleep. Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. God is working. A good and present and faithful and sovereign God is working in your life, around your life, and even, yes, through your life. How is he working? He's working for his glory, for your good, and for the advancement of the gospel. Remember that. God is working for his glory, for your good, and for the advancement of the gospel all at once. He's working. If there's ever a Bible character that tells us that that's the case, it's Joseph, sold into slavery by his Terrible brothers, falsely accused, unjustly imprisoned, 
and then unexpectedly promoted to be the prime minister of Egypt. And at the end of his story, as his brothers groveled in his presence and feared his judgment, he said, As for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass it as, is, as it is this day to save much people alive. Joseph told his 11 brothers, God was working. When he was a slave in Potiphar's house, God was working. When he was a prisoner in Egypt, God was working. When his brothers threw him in the pit as a young adolescent, God was working in his life. I don't know what you're dealing with, but God's working. While Moses was tending sheep <clears throat> that belonged to his father-in-law Jethro, God was working to prepare him to be a mighty deliverer of a nation. When David was delivering groceries to his brothers who were fighting on the front lines of the battle, God was working to prepare him as a shepherd king. When Daniel was kidnapped as a young man from his parents' home in Jerusalem and taken away to a strange land with a strange language and strange customs and taken away from everything he knew and loved, God was working to use Daniel greatly. When Peter was thrown in jail in Acts chapter 5, God was working to glorify himself to demonstrate his power, and to get the gospel to people. When Paul was caught in the storm at sea, God was working to get the gospel to people who otherwise would not have gotten the gospel. And when Jesus was on the cross, God was working. When everything seemed to be upended about who this miracle-working teacher who had never sinned, and everything seemed to have gone wrong, and everything crumbled around those disciples, and he hung on a cross and his mother wept and his disciples hid. God was working because three days later he rose from the grave and he was purchasing the redemption on that cross with his blood so that you and I could have the forgiveness of our sins, a relationship with God, and an eternal home in heaven. When you're waiting, God is working. That's why we need to choose faith over fear. It takes faith to believe that God is working when you don't see the results of it immediately, right? Choose faith over fear. What if I get sick? You might. But you could ask other questions that are not fear-based questions, but faith-based questions. You could ask, what if there's somebody that God can use me to witness to during this season that I could not have witnessed to otherwise. <clears throat> a, a world that's panicking needs a church filled with faith. And when the church is filled with faith, the world that's filled with fear can see something, a dynamic difference that's made in the lives of believers. What if this season sets me back financially? That's a legitimate question. But you could ask another question. What if I come out the other side of this season with a testimony of how God provided for me and met my needs as my faithful father? I have to be honest. I immediately asked the question two weeks ago. What if this pandemic affects our ability to pursue our church's purchase of 46 acres and ultimate <clears throat> construction of a larger worship facility and a relocation of the ministry to allow us to preach the gospel to more people than ever before. I asked that question. What if this threatens that? But I'm also trying to ask the question of faith as well. What if God does something unique in this situation and provides for us uniquely in some way and restructures this in some way so that it actually makes it more possible because of this difficulty? When we are waiting, God is working. I don't know what the Lord will do in your life or in our church, but I know he's working. Why? Because that's the story of the scriptures. He is a God who is always working. Author John Gordon said something good a couple of days ago online. He said, faith and fear both believe in a future that hasn't happened yet. Fear believes in a negative future. Faith believes in a positive future. If neither has happened yet, 
Why wouldn't we choose to believe in a positive future? We get to choose faith over fear. Watching the news, looking at the situation will fuel your fear. But feasting on the word of God will feed your faith. Believers can choose faith because we know we have a good, present, sovereign, faithful God who is working all things together for our good, for his glory, and for the advancement of the gospel. God has told us these things about himself. But my prayer for you, Bible Baptist Church family, this week and over the coming weeks is that you won't just know these things because they're printed in the scripture, but you'll know these things because they're experienced in your life. Your God is good and faithful and present and sovereign and working. There are a whole bunch of little things God's going to do during this, I'm sure. Some of you are going to get more rest as a result of what some have described as a forced Sabbath. Some of us are going to get much needed time with our families. That's a good thing. Some of us are reevaluating our priorities, and they needed reevaluating. Others of us are going to appreciate relationships that we before took for granted. There are probably some large things God's going to do during this as well. I pray that in your life, you become more connected and dependent directly on the Lord through prayer and Bible reading so that you alone in your own home are able to have a connection with the Lord that sometimes believers in the past have sort of depended on their gathering on Sundays to give them. But you'll discover the joy of walking with Jesus Monday to Saturday personally and privately. That's a huge thing. And I think that our neighbors and coworkers and friends are going to have an increased awareness of our own mortality as a human race and as of our own need for the Lord to have a certainty about what would happen if we were to lose our lives. I believe there are some people that will hear the gospel and that believers like you and me need to leverage this situation to share the hope that is in us, 1 Peter 3, with people who need an answer. As we come to the close of this online gathering, I do want to ask you, and I know this is maybe going to feel a little awkward through the computer screen, <clears throat> but I want to ask you to take a minute in just a moment and just bow your head and spend a moment in prayer. If we can make it work, maybe Nicole could play Great is Thy Faithfulness on the piano. But I just want to ask you to seek the Lord. Meditate on the five truths that we've just received. God is good. God is present. God is faithful. God is sovereign. And God is working. He's working in your life. He's governing over your life. And he wants to work through your life. If you're a believer who knows and loves the Lord, I want to just encourage you to pray a prayer of thanksgiving this morning. The Lord has revealed to you who he is. And I want to encourage you to thank him and praise him as I have done for who he is. Ask him to work in your life and around your life. I want to say to you that if you need to begin a relationship with the Lord, that today can be the day that you establish a relationship with this good, present, faithful, sovereign, loving God that will begin today and extend beyond your earthly existence into eternity, even after your departure. If that's your need, you can bow your head as well. You can just whisper a prayer to the Lord. If you believe that Jesus Christ is God's son who died for you and rose from the grave, and you understand that God created you, God loves you, you're accountable to God, and that you need forgiveness from him for the sins that have been accumulated over the course of your life that render you guilty. God is willing. As you repent, that means to turn to him, confess and acknowledge that you have sinned against him and that you have been away from him by your own choosing. I had to make that prayer of repentance myself many years ago. Everyone who knows the Lord has. If you're willing to repent, turn to the Lord, ask him to forgive your sin and be your savior. Today, in a moment, you can bow your head, pray and receive Jesus Christ as your savior. 
if that's the decision you make today or if you have questions about your relationship with the Lord. And this this got you started thinking about it, but you really have more questions that you need to get answered before you're ready to take that leap of faith. I want to encourage you to message us or email me at pastor at howellchurch.org. And I just want to say, God loves you. God knows you. He's with you where you're at right now. He's good. He's faithful. He's sovereign. And he invites you into a relationship with him, either for the first time today or for the thousandth time. He invites you to rejoice in and rest in your relationship with a good and present God. I'm going to pray. And then as I say amen, I'm going to ask you to pray as well. And we'll just stay here just for a moment through one verse of the song. If you need to pray and receive Christ as your Savior, pray that prayer today. If you need to thank the Lord or confess something else to the Lord, take some time to do that today, even as a believer. Let me pray. Father, we want to praise you for being a present, good, sovereign, faithful, working God in our lives. You didn't owe that to us, but you are that for us. We are humbled and grateful to be the object of your love and care. We praise you for this. We pray that you'd forgive us for those times when we've doubted you, departed from you, violated a life of obedience with you. And I pray that during this unusual season, we would become more aware of your presence in our lives and we would lean in through prayer and your word to walking with you more closely, depending on you more greatly and witnessing for you more boldly. I pray for those who may be watching this video today or sometime in the future who need you as their savior, who have not yet begun a relationship with you. I pray that they would receive you by faith today that they would join me, and as others are praying all over, that they would pray themselves, receiving you as Savior, accepting your forgiveness, confessing to you their great need for you, and becoming your son or your daughter by faith. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, once again, we praise you and thank you for your faithfulness and for initiating a relationship with us. When we were lost and when you were the furthest thing from our minds, you began working, even before we were created, to redeem our souls, to adopt us as your children, and to make us able, in spite of our sin, to have a relationship with you. We praise you for this. And I pray that you would work now all things together for the good of your people, for the advancement of the gospel, and so that more people would join us around the throne one day, as we've read in Revelation chapter 5, of every tribe, tongue, nation, people, and kindred, 
to say, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain and who redeemed us to God, to whom be glory and honor and power forever. We praise you. We thank you. And we ask you to watch over your people during this time. I pray for the people in our church who have needs, that you'd meet those needs faithfully. I pray that you'd place your hand of usefulness on our lives. And I pray that one day very soon, you would allow us to gather once again in person together as the gathered assembly, the body of believers that I believe to you is a beautiful thing to behold. And I pray that it would happen soon. We also look forward to your return, Lord Jesus, when we'll be gathered together with each other in your very presence. Until then, we praise you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for your tuning in today. And I want to thank, again, Pastor John, Tyler Smith, Nicole, uh, for making this possible technologically. I want to thank uh, Jessica Paisley for her work in the office this past week. Uh, she's been working diligently to help us stay connected as a church and to make sure we're communicating with each other. And I want to thank our deacons for reaching out to each other and for really helping us make sure that we reach out to every person in this family. And uh, brothers and sisters, look out for each other. And I know we've been doing that. And we're going to continue to do that. And I want to thank you for your faithfulness. I want to remind you of a few things I reminded you about before we began the message today. I want to remind you that every Sunday morning at 1030 until we gather in person again, we'll gather right here at 1030 on Sundays. You can find that uh, at howellchurch.org slash live stream. And that's where the content will be every single Sunday morning at 1030. Tuesdays at 7 p.m., Pastor John will be studying the Bible with all who gather online. And then on Thursday nights, I'll be studying the book of Philippians, verse by verse. We started with the first eight verses last Thursday. We'll continue in chapter one this Thursday. I want to encourage you also to continue checking every day our Facebook page. You can go to facebook.com forward slash BBC Howell, and you can find encouraging content there every day as well as the live broadcast on Sunday mornings, Tuesday nights, and Thursday nights. I want to remind you that uh, we can be faithful to the Lord in giving to the Lord in spite of not gathering as a church and bringing our offerings as we're used to. We can do that at howellchurch.org slash give. It's a brand new piece of software. It's a piece of software used by thousands of churches that is absolutely secure and very user-friendly, and we can set up our giving there each and every week as we honor and worship the Lord. As much as we're used to doing in person, we can do it digitally and virtually until we're able to do it in person again. And I want to remind you of one last thing. In just a minute or two, Mr. Jeff, one of our favorite Sunday school teachers. We have wonderful Sunday school teachers. They're all awesome. They're all creative. And maybe others of them will do this over the coming weeks. But Mr. Jeff is going to do an online children's church in just a few minutes. So gather the kids if there's kids around. Some of us adults are going to want to watch too. And uh, let's watch Mr. Jeff as he talks to us about the story of Joseph, one of the Bible characters that demonstrates a lot of the realities we preached about today. And uh, thank you, Jeff Hollister, for doing that. And uh, again, I want you to know that if you have a need as an individual or as a family, if you need groceries, if you need prescriptions picked up, if you need supplies, if you have utility issues or issues with your mortgage or your rent or your home or transportation, if you have a financial need, I want you to make sure you let us know. Or if you have a prayer request, and I want to remind you to keep praying for each other, and uh, let's do all we can to stay connected uh, Paul said that until we can meet together face to face, I want you to know I'm with you in heart and I'm greatly desiring to see you. That's how I feel about you. And I know that's how you feel about your church family. I hope you have a great day. God bless you.